Family Insurance Dream Bank, where we believe in the transformative power of dreams. I'm Madeline, and I'm thrilled to have you with us today. For those of you that are familiar with Dream Bank, welcome back. And for those of you that this is your first time joining us, welcome. Here at American Family Insurance, we believe communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's why we created Dream Bank, an inspirational community destination and digital experience dedicated to dreamers everywhere. From our daily event series to immersive signature programs, there's something for every dreamer. Our always free offerings are designed to help you celebrate the journey, celebrate your dream journey, overcome obstacles, and stay motivated. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Kira Wackett is a licensed mental health therapist specializing in shame and anxiety. She is the owner of Adversity Rising, a company who equips people with the confidence and skills to write their own stories. Her work ranges from one-on-one -on -one coaching to corporate wellness packages with a focus on what she calls an anti-band-aid movement or resisting the quick fix in favor of doing the work necessary to making meaningful and substantial change. The highlight of her work is her signature program, The Life AR, which she walks people through a five-part, five-step therapeutic process she believes can combat any pain point that comes our way because we're, we all deserve to live in a life which we can thrive. All right, Kira, I will let you take it away. Awesome. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. We're... This is the first time where I am doing anything in a webinar format. So you can't come off mute and I can't see your faces. So if people, people just want to go in the chat, let me know that you're hearing me, how you should. Everything is sounding good. I'll be able to see that pop through. Thanks, Maddie, for writing something in the chat for us. As we are getting started, I want everyone to just kind of take a second to get settled in. So I know as you are coming onto this webinar, you're sort of self-selecting into I'm a parent or a caregiver, which means that all of us do have a role or a hat that's really difficult for us to take off completely. I completely get it. I have my phone here with the emergency call number through. If something happens to Everly at school, they would be able to get through. And what we know is that oftentimes we use this sort of urgency idea to keep ourselves hooked up to everything. You don't need your email open right now. No one's going to email you if there's an emergency. They're going to call you. You don't need to have all those extra boxes open. You don't need to have any of your social media open. You don't need to have that project that you were working on open. So I want you to go ahead and close all of that. While you're getting yourself settled, you can also grab some paper if you want. We're going to be doing some reflections throughout. But again, just kind of coming into this space, we're going to be spending an hour and a half together. And the goal is that we're going to be able to go kind of a few layers deep today in that time. So to get us comfortable using the chat, I already saw some people doing it just to let me know we're hearing everything okay. But I just want to start off doing kind of an intro question and again, getting the chat sort of our place that we're going to go to and communicate with each other. So I want you to think about if you were to write a book or title a book based on your parenting journey up to this point. And so if you're not a parent or a caregiver yet, okay, great. Still up to this point, if you do have little ones or bigger kids, whatever that is, go ahead and put your book title. How would you describe your role or your life thus far? I love this. Some of you have obviously done this before, or you are so quick. We've got caffeine and chaos. Immediately, I was like, oh, I can resonate with that. Doing the best I can, figuring it out as I go. Life in times of organized chaos. Help me, LOL. I love that one. Learning on the fly. Let's keep going. Keep adding a few in there. I know it feels silly, but just kind of asking ourselves just to be honest, walking the coals. I can do hard things. I think, oh, I love that. They say, oh, chaos coordinator, running here, there, where, surviving the first three months. Yes, absolutely. Ooh, Mindy, I love that. Childhood trauma equals parenting trauma. That's going to be a big part of our conversation today. So even just putting that out into the space. Motherless mom, yes. Thinking about what that means for us and what that looks like to step into our roles and maybe that role for us is gone. Mom guilt, one step at a time. I love as I'm seeing this in there, each of you hopefully relating to the fact that nobody in here is like, I've got this, I'm the perfect parent. That is not a reality. That is not something that we have. So just starting to think about the fact that this is a struggle for all of us. I'm mentioning this, so I am a mom to a four-year-old. I am in no way, shape, or form coming on here going, look at me. I'm amazing. I'm the perfect parent, so I want to teach you how. 
I'm coming in here through the lens of I'm a therapist that has worked with young children all the way up to adults, but most of my time was spent with teens and sort of early adulthood and working with kids and young adults during that time frame on mental, emotional recovery, eating disorders, trauma, lots of different layers. So really honing in on how I've worked with parents and caregivers and those individual children that I got the chance to be with. But then also peppering in what I'm learning as a mom and how that connects into some of the things that I'm learning to do or the work that I do with my adult clients now as they are kind of reparenting and working through things themselves to show up as the parents they want to be. So I'm really kind of highlighting this. You are not going to walk away with here's your 10 steps to do and then you're going to feel like a great parent. That is just not possible. We are inundated right now in our culture with action steps, this idea of what you can do to fix or to manage X. In this case, maybe your relationship with your child, your role as a parent, or this idea of how to do more. So I think a lot about how we are sort of in this information overload. Well, they told you on Instagram how to man how to rotate the toys, how often to rotate the books, exactly what you're supposed to do the next time that your kid has a tantrum, the exact phrasing about what you're supposed to do when this happens. So if you're not doing it, this is a you problem, so you should try harder. That is not what we're talking about. We are talking about how to shift that in our mindset to recognize that our goal and role is to learn about how to show up in this iterative process of building a relationship with ourselves and our loved ones, not about getting it right. One of the things that I think is important and gets missed when we do sort of run down that sort of logic, I've got to fix it, I've got to do it all side, is we forget that we are emotional beings with the capacity for logic and doing. We are not logical beings with the capacity to feel. So first and foremost, we are emotional beings. So if we're not talking about emotions, but we're instead making everything content and logic driven, we're missing the mark. And we're always going to find ourselves back in that spot of feeling like it's not working anymore, or it still feels hard, or it feels really yucky in my body. Why is that happening? So our goal today is really to give you that space to say, what would it look like if I walked away with curiosity and maybe excitement's a little bit too bold. Maybe we say just a willingness to sort of embrace the idea that you're going to continue to screw this up. And the goal is to kind of cycle upwards, to keep learning. I think about even in the context of my relationship, I've been with my husband for almost 15 years. I'm still learning how to show up in our relationship the ways that I can and want to as he evolves, as I evolve, as we evolve. And so thinking about that in our adult relationships, they don't look the same over time. And so again, this idea of how do I really cultivate curiosity to allow my relationship with my kid, my role as a parent, and therefore my view of them and how they show up in the world to be more of that iterative sort of processing space. So if you have paper, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and write it on your paper. If you are just somebody that likes to process in your head, go ahead and take a second. Eventually, I'd love to see in the chat for everybody, just given that subtle shift and reframe that I'm not giving you all action steps, do these five things, it'll be fine. But more this idea that our job is to really reframe, to re-anchor on emotions, to seeing ourselves in more of this iterative space. I want us all to get very clear on an intention that we can carry with us today. So just thinking about that for yourself, again, you can go ahead and write it on your own paper. If you're comfortable right away to dump it in the chat, that would be great. I'd love to see some of them just to know how are you going to show up today and what is a reasonable expectation and commitment you can make to yourself as you sit here in this space. Angela shared active listening. I think that's an amazing intention. So the idea of I'm not expecting myself to walk away knowing, okay, here's everything I'm going to do. I'm just going to let myself show up and listen. Maddie and I often talk about some of the presentations that we put on together are kind of like a buffet and the idea of what does it look like just to show up and let yourself receive the information and trust that you're going to pick out the part that's really helpful for you in that next step. I love that. Mike says learning. I don't always have to have the answers. 
and that that's not the goal. And oftentimes when we get stuck feeling like we need to have the answers, that's more about our ego and less about us showing up in this relationship. Yeah, Renee, paying full attention without my boxes open and trying not to be distracted and being open-hearted. I love that too. And that means with ourselves, that lack of judgment or shame that's gonna come up as we have this conversation. So just keep taking a second, again, really putting down what's your intention here. This is really important, especially then to put it either in the chat or if this needs to stay yours for now, keeping it on a piece of paper. When we can anchor by getting it out of our head, it helps us stay rooted. Because as we start talking, your shame, your self-judgment is going to try to take you in a way negative headspace. So if we can come back to a visual, something we can look at and say, look, my job is just, it's here. My job isn't to try to solve everything in this moment. My job isn't to try to fix everything. My job isn't to shame myself for what I didn't do or did do before this moment. My job is just to be here. I like that. Give and accept grace. That's really powerful and with ourselves and with other people. And then again, just being present. Sounds like for a lot of people, just being here is really going to be that key. So I want us to think about the fact a lot of the times we kind of have this idea of how to make parenting easy or this, this sort of comparative parenting is harder now, parenting is harder then. What does it look like? Parenting has always been hard. It is one of the most difficult roles that we are ever going to endure. Parenting is also a very different kind of hard today than it was before. So just using the chat, I'm curious why some people think it might be hard in a different way. Again, we're not saying harder. It doesn't matter if your parents or your grandparents thought that their time was hard or whatever it is, just a different kind of hard. What makes our circumstances different now than maybe in past generations for parenting? Again, just go ahead and dump it in the chat. Any thoughts that you have? Social media? Absolutely. Yes, that highlight reel versus reality. I think that is such an important piece, really thinking about, I mean, we're seeing this, all of you immediately starting to say social media. So we know that that is coming up. More parents working outside of the home. The value of money, that is such an important piece. The idea that we want to be friends with our children, not just dictators. And so if this idea of, I don't want to feel like how, how, or I don't want my kids to feel like how I did when I was growing up. I want to be more collaborative with them. But when we don't have a gauge for what that looks like, we end up just sort of swinging to the opposite side. So what does that look like? How do you be a full-time mom and a full-time employee? Absolutely. This idea of more responsibility constant news and information older overload, the feeling that our kids respect us in a different way. And again, that sort of swinging of if we're not authoritarian and our kids aren't just sort of complicit and compliant because they're afraid of us, what does that look like to talk about respect in a co-created manner instead of the idea that we deserve their respect just because we're their parents? Jenny says, breaking the generational traumas. Absolutely. And now these kind of ideas of what it looks like to gentle parent and what it looks like to do some of these things. And I love these ideas. We'll talk about them more in a second. And oftentimes those concepts are about 10 steps away of the work that we need to do. So I think you all have covered most of them. I think the biggest thing I think about is that as we've shifted, each generation has become increasingly more independent. So this idea of I've got to do it all myself. And so we're working full time. We're trying to be parents for our children. There's this emphasis on independence. I don't need anything. I don't need a village. And so that lack of that sort of communal aspect has shifted. We're also constantly should it on. There's so because of the information, we have this, you should do this, you should do this this overload or this barrage of inputs, not just in social media, but in the way that because everybody's so independent and we're all just trying to make sure that we're doing okay, right? So then as soon as anybody else has something, we're just sort of dumping on other people of what they should do based on our own experiences. Our culture is also faster. The pace, the expectation, everything is busier. We're also sort of rooted in this idea of fine. And so with the world moving as fast as it is, it's hard for us to pause. And it sort of reinforces the idea of we just got to fix and move forward. We also, I haven't seen this. I might've missed it if it came up in the chat. But one of the things I think is incredibly important, every generation has had some form of collective trauma, wars, major losses. We're not really talking about the fact though that we went through a pretty major trauma with COVID and what that social isolation has done on our social and emotional developmental skills. And so us as adults, the children, depending on how old they were, 
when COVID happened, what that's looked like. But there's a pretty collective trauma that's happened. And because this happened at the same time that social media or all these other outlets were there, we also sort of became aware of just how much more deeper work we have to do. And I think this is really fair to say that this is sort of the first generation of parents that have been sitting with all of that weight. And then it was like, okay, everything was paused for a second. And now we've picked back up. So there's no room to complete the processing. But mainly I think about how Ultimately, because of all of this, I don't know if any one of you on here is like, no, I'm great. I feel like I have all of the energy that I need and everything feels wonderful. And I just feel like every day I wake up and I've got extra in the tank. We're burnt out. We are constantly struggling and overwhelmed and just trying to keep our head above water. And so when anything happens that veers off course, i.e. something with our kids doesn't go right, maybe they have a tantrum, they're taking too long to do something, they're not following whatever our expectation is, we get triggered. And oftentimes that results in us reacting in ways that we don't want to because the breathing room is no longer in our system. So all of this has really kind of shifted away from our focus because again, that quickness makes us think, okay, so our job is to figure out how we master this. And our kids just have to get on board. This idea that they just need to listen and they need to follow and they need to go along with this. I've even thought about this in the context of when Everly was really little. I mean, she's four, so she's still really little, but like two. And I'm like, I'm going to plan this perfect sensory activity. And this is exactly how it's going to go because I'm supposed to be able to do this. I'm supposed to be able to give her these experiences. Instagram said it's super easy. And I go to do it and I have this idea of exactly how it's supposed to play out. And then she's completely disinterested and doesn't want to do it. Or she ends up having some thing happen and she makes this big mess that now I'm stressed about that I have to pick up or maybe she reacts in a certain way. And then I'm reacting to that because in my head, I'm creating this idea of this is how things are supposed to go. When they don't, it automatically feels like something is wrong. There's no sort of flexibility or fluidity to be in the moment. So I think about a lot of this here, sort of the things that we've kind of gotten conditioned to believe in is that our kids need the top rated stuff. I don't know if anyone else is at like a parent or a grandparent say to them, in our day, we just, you know, put kids in a box. They didn't need these fancy beds. Or in our day, we didn't need to have baby monitors or we didn't need to have these things or the toys now. And so this idea, though, that we sort of built this up, like we're supposed to have all these items to be able to be sufficient in our parenting and to make sure that our kids are okay. We've also seen a really big emphasis on gentle parenting and this idea that we need to be able to manage every emotion that our kids have from a calm, very soft, communicated state. We never elevate. We talk like this all the time. This is how we're going to set boundaries and it's going to work. Now, it does in some instances. It doesn't in all instances. And the expectation that we're going to be A-plus gentle parents puts on us this idea of, again, performance rather than us learning how to respond authentically in those moments. We've also seen a lot more comparison and checklists that have happened. So all these, we know there's always been milestones, but there's such a greater emphasis on what are people doing? When are they doing it? Are you matching these things? I even think about there was a I forget what the company was called, but it was all about speech and early learning. And I was following and looking along about how many words is somebody supposed to say by a certain time and what are the sounds supposed to look like and what percent of their language is supposed to be understood. And then you're constantly like, okay, but am I doing enough? Am I helping them enough? Are they excelling? Are they exceeding? So there's this pressure of this rate of growth on them and on us that feels really overwhelming. And I think ultimately it's this idea that our job is to be perfect parents because all the information is there. So we have no excuse. We're supposed to be able to function in this role. It's easy, right? Parenting shouldn't be that hard. That's sort of the undertone in a lot of what we're hearing. And we're still trying to heal from our own wounds when we were kids and we don't want to be like our parents or caregivers. Or on the flip side, we have to be just like them, but even better. So really thinking about sort of the overall emphasis this has and the pressure it puts on us. But what we've actually learned is that children to feel seen, safe, and heard don't need any of that. What they need are these three elements. They need safe, secure connection. They need honesty, which means predictability, truth. Yes, I know that our kids can struggle with that at some point in time, but it's about us being honest, which in that includes our accountability and owning our own stuff. And they need to cultivate resilience. 
So I want to talk a little bit about what resilience is. So our goal really today is to think about emotional resilience, but resilience is sort of a general statement is the capacity to withstand or to recover from difficulties. So the idea of when hard stuff happens, trusting in themselves and the tools, com community support, whatever is around them, that they have what they need to get through it. Not the idea that our job is to never experience hard things, which many of us as parents, if I were to be in a room with you right now and I said, show of hands, how many people want to do whatever they can to make their kids not have to feel those painful feelings that we did as a kid, we'd all raise our hands. But that's not the goal. The goal is to say that feeling pain, feeling distress is normal and necessary. So we want to equip them and ourselves to be able to tolerate that and to trust that we can move through it and be okay. And in the process of this, being able to move through it in a way that ultimately aligns with our values. So there's a couple things. I will say this, you're all going to get a copy of the slides so that not many of the slides have a lot of content that you want necessarily. They're just kind of anchor words, but ones like this, don't rush to write them down. You can screenshot it if you want, or you will get a PDF copy of the slides. So just know that that's coming. Again, if we can come back to many of you wanting to just be in that active listening state, just kind of hearing it and seeing it. But many of the things that we think about then and what we want to cultivate for our kids has a lot more to do with adaptability, flexibility, communication styles, really thinking about how do we cultivate this sense of self-efficacy and worth. I do see some questions coming in the chat about the recording. So yes, but I'm also going to let Maddie comment in the chat about that too, on when the recording gets shared, how it's going to get shared, because I don't entirely know Dream Bank's timeline with that. But we will make sure that Maddie puts something in the chat about that for everybody and then can come off at the end to make sure that we confirm as well. But really thinking about this notion of how do we help them? And we've seen this with our kids. We've seen this with ourselves too, but particularly kids. As they're learning and expanding, their brain is very rigid. Things are yes or no, all or nothing. My daughter is just out of the phase where she counts days by how many sleeps there are. She has a really difficult time for a long time with like, well, what? Well, nap was bedtime, right? It's a new day now. Their brains have a really hard time with sort of differentiating things. And then as they get older, flexibility is just increasingly harder. There's got to be a right way to do things and they've got to figure that out. And then there's nuances that get layered in. Our job is to help them build that flexibility as early as possible. Even if their brains can't necessarily put it into practice, how do we start naming that for them? And just in case anyone didn't see it in the chat, I says we'll have the recording up by Friday and we'll have an email that'll go out that'll give everybody the link to it as well. So as I hear this and I think about, okay, so our job is actually not to get it perfect and to know every answer. Our job is actually to just be there with our kids. That actually sounds way more simple than what we're doing. Because what we're doing right now feels like we're just setting ourselves up to fail all the time because it's not working. It's leaving us feeling like we're not getting it right. And so this should be easier, but it's not. It feels increasingly harder to be able to do. Now, there are three key reasons why I think this is difficult. We're going to pause when we're done with this just to let you all kind of journal or reflect in the chat about what's coming up and if there's more that I'm missing. But the first, and we kind of already started to call this out, even just in looking at your book titles, because we were not taught as children that emotions were something that deserved to be explored, processed, moved through. They were stuffed down. We were taught to avoid, to pretend they didn't exist, to move on from them as quickly as possible. They were inconvenient. They were a problem. They got in the way of whatever else needed to be done. So we didn't grow up learning that, gosh, when you're feeling sad, you can feel sad for as long as you want. And guess what? It's not a forever feeling. Right now, maybe you just need to be sad. Let's sit here and cry. Or God, you're really angry right now. You know what? That anger makes total sense. I might feel that way too. Let's go and find something that we can do or let's give you some skills or tools to move through that anger so it doesn't feel destructive. That wasn't the conversation. I still think back to this one time my aunt was getting ready for a party and I had a lot of trauma growing up. I was living with them at this time just based on some childhood trauma and as I'm there, I'm, I was feeling a big feeling. I don't know exactly what happened or what was, why I was so upset, but I was really upset. And I went to talk to her about it while she was setting up for the party. And in some iterative or iteration, she basically said, we don't have time for that right now, or we don't, this is inconvenient in some way. But particularly, I remember her saying, you need to learn to put a happy face on. 
So the idea being, she didn't actually tell me my emotions can't be there. She just told me that no one else can know about them. So this idea even of, for many of us, it was maybe stuff, avoid, but really it was this sort of disconnection between our internal self and the performance self that we put out into the world. And when you did express emotions, you got something like this. So this is a screenshot of a card that I got on my 13th birthday from my grandma. And she wasn't the only person that would call me these things, but because I was somebody that felt my emotions and I didn't, I didn't know how to stuff them down. I got like a D plus in the emotion stuffing category. And so even though I thought that's what you were supposed to do, my feelings were big and I was having a really hard time and not dealing with them sometimes made them come out in more destructive ways. And so I remember getting this birthday card and my whole family kind of laughing and kind of being like, yeah, of course that makes sense. But then this idea of, Okay, well, others blend into the background, which apparently is the better thing to do. You prefer to make a scene. You're a gorgeous, glowing, tantrum-throwing, darling drama queen. So now what that does is it tells me you're not very good at doing that, and now everybody's going to see you as being emotional. You're kind of an inconvenience. You make this bigger and this idea of drama queen being dramatic, even now it's a word that I don't ever want to say to my kid, even though it's inherently a neutral term, but this idea of being dramatic, gosh, I didn't want anybody to tell me that. So you think about for all of us, what you were taught, moments that you had a feeling, again, as a very young child, but all the way up, this was teenage years. What did that feel like? Now layer this back in. We already started talking about culture, but this culture of fine. The expectation is that you are fine all the time. I mean, it comes out like clockwork. How are you? Fine. Doing okay? Yep. Need anything? Nope. We are conditioned. It's so automatic because if you're not fine, it's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of vulnerability. And not only are you going to admit that weakness, but you're going to inconvenience someone else and they've got to keep going. So now you're a problem for them that they have to solve. So mixed in with this sort of fine is this, but we are supposed to keep going. Emotions have no place there. We've also seen this in the context of our bodies. So just, again, using the chat, I'd love to hear how many of you have put off maybe taking a lunch break just so you could finish a task that you needed to at work. Or you were avoiding, you were like, oh, I just got to drive 20 minutes further, even though you, your body is saying I need to stop and go to the bathroom now on your road trip. Or you're really tired, but you stay up an extra hour to get something done because you need to finish that before you go to bed. So we start to erode our connection, not only with our emotional self, but our physical self. And that's really where we start to connect to our emotions. So seeing this, how many of us are having this show up? Now, that third layer of our culture, go back to social media, the input overload, because it isn't often, even the people that are saying, gosh, you know, parenting is hard or everything sucks. There's still this idea of, so then you can create content out of it and at least be useful. So at least you can get paid to make content to tell other people that it's hard. So you're not even doing that. So now you're just wasting your time complaining about this, whatever this is, and just kind of thinking about all of these ideas. So as we're going through this, there's sort of this third layer that comes into play, which is, and I don't know if anyone's ever heard this term before. I actually think it was Anna Kendrick in an interview that she gave, but somebody I was listening to recently talked about gravity problems. This idea of how often are we trying to solve a problem that we can't solve? And so for many of us, part of the reason it becomes difficult too is as we're trying to be perfect, we're trying to control away an emotional experience ourselves or with our kids. The reality is you're going to lose your temper. You're going to feel like you're a terrible parent. You're going to have days where all you want to do is cry. And for some reason, and you might not be able to figure out what it is, but you think you should be able to, you're feeling like everything has to happen and be in a certain way. But because of that, because you're sort of putting yourself in this pressure, you're also dismissing the fact that your kids are going to have emotions. Gosh, there's going to be a day that your kid is going to need to do something or have a big feeling, and you're going to think that's inconvenient. The tantrum at the store isn't to make your life hard or to make every other parent think that you don't ma matter. The tantrum at the store is because they're having a big feeling, and it might be inconvenient. It's happening at that time, but they don't know how to do this any better than you do. In fact, they have less skills than you do to be able to figure it out. So I just want to pause for a second because we're going to kind of shift into what can we do? And we're going to break this down into how we can support ourselves and then how we can support our kids. But I just want to give you all the opportunity to just kind of sit for a minute with anything that came up. Feel free to use the chat if you have questions that are coming up that you can put in there or just kind of take some time to journal. We'll take about a minute. 
And then we're going to layer in that next piece. This is a great time. Some of you said you actually need to take a break right now. Go take a break if you need to. Again, we're going to take about a minute and just do some reflecting. And then we're going to layer in that next part. And as I'm seeing some questions come in again, feel free to just take your time to journal, ignore my voice if you're kind of in your head. Jane, can you elaborate in the chat if what you're wanting to do is to help them understand why they feel big emotions, but and you're still struggling with the role of emotions? Or is it just in that moment, you're struggling with your emotions, so it's difficult to help explain to them what's going on? And I see, Angela, your question, how to work through my child's big emotions when I'm having big emotions myself in that moment. Absolutely. So we'll talk a little bit about that, how we anchor that when we're both feeling activated or triggered. And again, if other people have things that they're thinking about, questions they want to make sure that we hit, especially as we're making that transition into action steps, feel free to put them in now. This is a great time and space. So I know to make sure I hit on those if I don't already have them planned in the content. We'll take about 30 more seconds. A mm. couple more points coming in. How to acknowledge the reality of my own struggles while not shorting my child of what they need. I really want to help my child navigate their emotions without the urge to people, please. Like you don't have to be happy for me. Yeah. And Jane, thanks for elaborating. So how to help them get to the root cause of why they're having a meltdown. When I know myself, there are times I feel something, but it takes a lot of digging. Yeah. And so even for a lot of these pieces, and we'll talk about them in here, so much of this is about how to allow both things to be true, our big feelings at the same time that something else is happening, and then how to know when it's helpful to have these process conversations versus when we're too activated to have them. So a lot of the times we've had this issue where many of us try to be able to do all of this in one sitting. What we forget is that we can come back multiple times. So oftentimes in the moment is not the time to do the digging or the teaching. Our job is to just kind of move through the emotion and then come back when the brain can actually turn on that logic spot and come back to it and have those conversations. So we're going to talk about that a little bit here just overall. Yeah, Mindy says, I've heard the term sit on the bench with your child. But again, this is hard when we're overwhelmed. And if we're being honest, it's also hard because sometimes in these moments, we don't like our kids. We still love them. I'm just going to say it because nobody really wants to say it out loud. But sometimes it's really, really tricky when it feels like the responsibility is on us to help them through something when they've just done something so mean to us or hurtful to us. And we don't like them in the moment. And we're stressed and overwhelmed. And nobody's sitting on the bench with us having the conversation. So I'm feeling a little bit unseen. And now I'm just supposed to be here. And we're supposed to, what, move through this and go back to playing? That's really, really hard. And so really starting to figure this out. And again, just acknowledging that these things happen. These things exist. Yeah, and Jane, I love that. And I definitely want to layer that in as we keep talking. But the idea of sometimes being able to take our own space, it's really, really tricky, especially when we come to thinking about how to take space. So growing up, many of us were told this sort of the timeout, you need to leave the room. That's a shame-based reaction. You're being rejected because you're having a feeling or you did something that I don't like. We can still talk consequences for behavior and we're going to get to that. But what we're seeing is ultimately the shift could be instead, 
what I'm feeling right now is unsafe in this space, I'm going to take myself out of the room or I'm noticing that I'm feeling really reactive and I can't respond the way that I want to right now. I need a few minutes to myself and then I'm going to come back in the space. What we're modeling through that, and again, we'll come back to this in a little bit, but what we're modeling is how we can take space, not punish somebody for taking up space because that's not going to register to them of I'm just trying to punish the emotion or the behavior to them. It's going to feel like a rejection of them as a person. Okay, so as we think about this overall, I'm going to break this down. Like I said, we're going to talk first about you and some of the work for you, because a lot of us, and we've heard this, this whole put your mask on first, but the pressure still feels like we've got to apply it as a parent. So many of us don't feel like we have the time and space to work through our own pain. But when we don't do that, it never translates to change with our kids overall. So I want to break this part down first. I'm going to invite a couple spaces for pause and reflection as we go. So again, just continuing to do that work using the chat and kind of seeing what more is coming up as we do this. But the first thing that you need to do, many of you that have been in sessions with me before through the Dream Bank or otherwise know that I talk a lot about shame. So shame is this fear that exists inside of us that we are unworthy of love, connection, and belonging. It's this constant sort of vigilance that your body exists in that you're just sort of waiting to be rejected. You're waiting for people to kind of tell you that you don't matter or you don't belong. And we think about this, even again, if you go back to the tantrum in the store, if anyone's ever had that with their kid or their kid didn't act in a certain way that they would have expected them to in front of somebody else, the reason that you're feeling upset has nothing to do with the fact that your kid did that. It's the shame you feel because you feel like you've somehow not met an expectation and you are going to be judged in some way. So what's really helpful for us is to think about how many of the stories that we're telling ourselves about how we're supposed to parent are specific to us. So if you think about your expectations for you as a parent, if those expectations are different from the other parents, your friends that you have around you, then we know that those are rooted to shame. Parenting as a general rule is values-based and there's sort of a general theme about how to raise and be supportive as we're raising our children. If there's this notion of, but here's this checklist and I've got to do it all, but if my friend didn't do it, I would totally be able to give them grace. That tells me that that's coming from a place of shame. Again, shame being this idea that we have these incredibly unrealistic expectations because we believe at our core that we are garbage. We are less than. Everybody else doesn't have to make up for this stuff because you know what? They have more worth and value, but I, I'm broken. I'm the problem. So I have to be able to make up for and be even better. My kid can't have those experiences. They can't do those things. I can't have those experiences or do these things. And what's interesting is the more that we peel this back, again, this isn't just happening with your kids. This isn't just happening in this role. You've been doing this since well before you became a parent or a caregiver. This likely showed up in school. This has showed up in romantic relationships, friendships, this idea that what you do and how you take care of everybody else or how you perform for everybody else supersedes who you are is that basis of shame. And it's been happening since you were a little kid. So this notion of, I think about me as a very small child, I developed a belief by the time I was in kindergarten that people who got A's were better than people who didn't. You had to have better grades. That made me somehow better if I did that because that's what was taught. That's the smarter people, right? This notion that your body is supposed to look a, a certain way. You're supposed to act a certain way. I knew how to perform in front of adults, teachers, other sort of mentors and people because if you do that, then things are easier. Not just, well, sometimes those adults don't deserve the same respect. Sometimes those adults are doing things that are hurtful or harmful. Instead, it was, you just do this because this is what you do to get along. So all of this messaging and even thinking about it, many of you describe you're working outside of the home. You're doing it in your jobs right now. I can't take a lunch break. I can't set a boundary. I can't tell my boss no. I can't tell them that I'm so overwhelmed. I've barely got the last three things done that I need to without feeling like my brain is going to implode. I just have to keep saying yes. I can't say no because I have to keep proving my worth and my value. Now, as we do this, I don't know how many of you have started to hear this. I feel like this is sort of the next term that's getting popularized sort of in mainstream culture, but there's this notion of we have an inner child. Well, what I think about when I think about doing our shame work is we have to go back to these very parent, uh, I, I was rereading the reparenting yourself at the same time. We have to go back to these very specific notions of when did I feel dismissed? 
When did I feel othered? When did I learn or absorb this idea that I have to be X to be good enough? And we don't have time to layer this in today, but if we really think about this, there's this other aspect of identity. So when you think about race, gender, socioeconomic status, ability status, religion, all those identities affected this shame storyline. All of those interpretations of what you had to do, who you were supposed to be, how you were supposed to perform, all of those pieces weighed in on things. Now, when you go back and you start to think about your inner child, what it really means is finding those moments, the you, and all of us could find one right now, a moment in time where we remember feeling rejected. We remember feeling unseen. We remember feeling like we didn't matter. Specifically, if you can think of an example with a parent or a caregiver, those moments where you felt like, gosh, I went to them and I needed something and they didn't give it to me. Those moments basically think about sort of a general trajectory. If any of you have ever seen Inside Out and how all the memory balls just sort of get put up on library shelves and they all go to their proper places, those moments basically break away and they kind of float out here. And the more of those moments that we have, the more pulled we get back into those spaces. So when we're triggered by our kids, when something happens, again, the example of maybe the tantrum in the store or when your kid doesn't listen to you. Or for me, it was something where when my daughter, again, who's four and is appropriately supposed to lie at different points, they're supposed to try that on when she does it, I get so triggered and have a really hard time being able to say to her, that makes total sense that you did that. And it's really important we tell the truth. Instead, I basically want to cry and scream and make it all about how she's hurt me. Because when I was a kid, the way that lying happened and how often it occurred, it's my inner child basically just screaming and saying, I just want somebody to be honest with me. So my reaction sort of gets outweighed by my own stuff. I'm no longer responding to her in the moment. I'm reacting. So this is a really heavy concept for us as we think about this and we think about sort of the concept of our inner child. What I want you to really think about is how do you start to mine for the moments that you felt unseen, that you felt unsafe, that you felt unheard? Again, go back to specifically thinking about you with your parents or your caregivers and what was that like for you? When did you feel abandoned? When did you feel like a burden? When did you feel like you didn't fit in because you had an opinion or you looked a certain way or you acted a certain way? Now, the other piece I want you to think about, because this is a really key point, many of us parent from a place of saying, I don't ever want to have, I don't ever want my kid to feel like how I felt. So then that turns into, I'm never going to do what my parent or my caregiver did. I'm never going to respond that way. Even if we think our parents are great, we still have moments that we will say, I'm never going to do that. When we're parenting from that place, that's really not about our kids. That's not about showing up to be an authentic parent. That's about us trying to reparent ourselves. We still have a wound that hasn't been healed. So as you start to do this work, and again, this is why we can't give you a checklist and solve this today. This is weeks. This is months. This is working with a therapist or a coach or someone to help you really break this down. You start to get clear on, gosh, these are all these pockets where I didn't feel these things, where my emotions, I didn't move through the tunnel. I didn't complete an emotional cycle. I'm still stuck there. I'm still angry. I'm still scared. I'm still feeling rejected. What you can do now is to start to give them space to feel seen. So if you imagine this, it's almost like being able to kind of turn and face that version of you, maybe that five-year-old you, that 12-year-old you, that 17-year-old you, and let them talk to you and tell you what that felt like. And just start to make space to listen to what was going on. Not to try to tell yourself that's dumb or silly or look, you're fine now. Why does it still matter? But the idea that that story and that pain hasn't had a platform to fully be heard and it's okay if we just make space to hear it. So I want to pause because I'm going to move to the next layer of this. And I just want to pause and see if there's any questions coming up because it's a really big concept. So thinking about what this means can feel a little bit overwhelming. So if there's questions or anything that's coming up, you can use the chat. Or again, just take a minute and jot down what's coming up for you. If you think about what this would look like, if you were to begin this work and start to do some of this as you were to move forward, to understand that how you're showing up now is directly correlated to the times that you didn't feel seen, safe, and heard when you were a kid, what does that mean? What's that next step for you?
I'm seeing more and you put, I get triggered when my daughter's having a screaming tantrum because my needs were not met as a child and my body remembers this. And I have a physical trauma response and I'm so worried that she is being traumatized. So right there, this notion of, gosh, I have this really intense feeling that happens. And what is that? What am I putting on to my daughter? How does my daughter absorbing my story? And it sounds like to me that there's a lot of pain that gets kicked up for you. And I don't know how old your daughter is, but it's also something that we try to separate. I don't want them to have to be responsible to help me treat my trauma or move through things either. She's three. Okay. So really this notion of she doesn't understand what's happening and her emotional range and capacity, basically from three to five, these new really deep emotions are coming in and they feel them at these extremes. And it's basically like the concepts introduced and then it's like glitter. It's everywhere and it's all over the place. And then eventually it kind of comes back down and it puts itself into balance. So this notion is that she's feeling all these really big things. Her brain is also only able to be in the moment. So after something happens, she moves past it really quickly. So it's hard because when you're reacting in that space, knowing, well, her brain can't come back tomorrow and talk about it. What do we do in those moments? So for you, and we'll talk about this, this next part of the adult phase is going to be about how you start to tolerate your distress. One of the things that we can do is you've taken the time to name this, which is really key. So you know, when this happens, I feel this way. And now we can say, when I feel this way, this is what my brain and body does to try to survive in that moment. Because my brain is jumping back to this time, it's not here. My body is not in the present moment. Once you've done that, we can start to figure out, one, what do we need to do sort of on the back end, either with a therapist, with a coach to process that because it has we haven't moved through it on a deeper level. Two, in the moment, what can we do when we start to feel that? Because there's a yellow zone before it comes into red. There's a yellow zone. How do we recognize that? And then what do we do to anchor the body back down in the present moment? Typically, it's a sensory element that we can use to kind of help come back into that space and place. This is sometimes where some somatic work or things can help as well. But the notion being we need to do the deeper processing over here. We can't do that in the moment. We can't expect ourselves to be able to do it. Instead, we go, gosh, my body is still trying to help me survive. And it's not recognizing right now that this interaction with my daughter isn't a threat to my survival. So what do I need to do on the back end to kind of help kind of separate those out? And then there's some work you can do to start to write some new pathways in the brain and start to use actually what's called cognitive rehearsal to start to wire and lay down the foundation for new pathways. So then it's when I'm in the yellow zone, this is what I do to re-anchor. If I'm going into the orange zone, this is what I do to re-anchor. And if I get to the red zone, then the best thing that I can do is make sure she's safe in whatever room she's in and I need to leave until I'm back down in the orange, yellow, or green zone to move forward. We'll talk about a few more things in all of this as well too, but just sort of an idea to get us started with that. So one of the things that's really important as you do this work is something called radical acceptance. So radical acceptance, again, sort of another buzzword that's been talked about a lot, but the notion of it is ultimately to be able to go, what can I control? What can't I control? And how do I only assume responsibility for the things that I can control? So we cannot control whether or not your kids have a tantrum. We cannot control whether or not your kids react the way that you want them to. We cannot control all of the things that are going to happen to them in and outside of your home and space. Even this notion of we're talking specifically and some of these examples have been maybe anger or big feelings that our kids have that trigger us. But I also think about I watched my kid go through an experience of being rejected by a friend who was not consciously trying to be mean. And I saw it as I was leaving drop off where my kid just felt like completely crushed and how the teachers are responding. And you just want to stop that from ever happening. You want to go up to the other kid and be like, no, let's try something different. I don't want anyone to feel this way. And I know as she gets older, it's going to happen more. We've all felt it. So the radical acceptance piece is about recognizing with our kids what we can and can't control. The other thing we have to step back and recognize is that we can't control what we were taught. We can't control our trauma or our past stories up to this point. So we can't control when we felt abandoned. We can't control when and how our body adapted survival tactics to move through something at a time that we needed it. We can't control how you've parented up till this point right now. No control over it. You've done your best. You have done the best that you could with the resources and the capacity that you had at hand. And you can't control the fact that new hard things are going to happen for you too. I wish we could put our lives in a vacuum and expect that things are going to go okay. I don't know if anybody else has had a fall, winter, spring that was as bad as it was 
for us and our family, but it felt like I spent six months sick with maybe three days off in the entire time. I couldn't control that. I couldn't control the fact, I mean, we were hand washing, we were doing all the things that we could do. You're still going to get sick. So just knowing that there are things that we can't control, but you can control the fact that you are able and deserve to give yourself and your kids space and grace. You can control the pace at which you move through life and that you expect them and yourself to function in. So even thinking about, we got in this mindset of, I mean, every day we were getting ready to leave. And again, anyone that's had a little child in their life, it happens when they're older too, but it feels like you need 45 minutes to get out the door. And it's no matter when you start, feels like you're always going to be late when you get out the door. So the idea being, I started to have this mindset of like, we're late, we're late, we got to go and sort of rushing and realizing that that was just feeding into this hustle culture and recognizing I am always so afraid that I'm going to inconvenience somebody, that I'm going to be late, that I'm going to let them down, that things aren't going to go the way that they need. And I'm carrying that into all of these moments with my daughter. At the end of the day, what's the worst thing that happens if we're five minutes late to her dentist appointment? They're never on time anyway. So why am I yelling at her to get in the car? She's moving. She's not just ignoring me. So why am I just going to create this thing that I can't control it? Kids are slow. They are they are squirrel. Dogs seeing squirrels. That's all I think of is that dog from, what is it, up? That's just like squirrel, squirrel. That is what our kids do. How do I roll with that? We can start to also then think about the false beliefs. We can control whether or not we hold them any longer. So I'm going to layer in here that for some of you that have talked about some trauma, you can go deeper in this and think about the fact that many of us have beliefs that came out of our trauma that are survival-based. So when you think about it, you needed those beliefs, those rules, those reactions to help you during those moments. They're not as helpful now. So just starting to think about that again, for those of you that have named that, that's another place to maybe think about some deeper work you can do. But for all of us to think about the idea of pain is not a bad thing. We cannot experience joy, wonder, fulfillment if we don't also experience all of these other emotions. The emotion is not the problem. It's how we move through the emotion and the meaning that we make as a result of it. So trying to only see that these emotions are good and I need my kid to act this way and I'm supposed to feel happy and good and fine all the time, that's not true. You can be a good parent and feel really, really sad. You can be a good parent and not like your kid in that moment and feel angry at them. You can still be a good parent. You can be a good employee even though you feel burnt out and you feel overwhelmed and you don't like your job in the moment. It is okay to have those thoughts and those feelings. And so the goal being, how do we let go of this idea that emotions are good or bad? These ones can be seen. These ones can't. The second part of it is then to think about, we don't have to fix things. So many of us are always trying to fix something to make it okay. I saw this a few weeks ago at a soccer game where this kid was having this reaction because he lost his gum. I don't know why he had, had gum on the soccer field, but he had a piece of gum in his mouth. He's three and a half, maybe four, and he lost his gum and then started crying and got really upset because apparently that was a really big deal for him in that moment. And the mom basically was just like, shh, shh, and like shoving gum back in his mouth to stop this because I'm assuming she felt embarrassed because he was having this huge reaction over a piece of gum. And after that was done, I went and sat next to her and I said, gosh, that sounded like that felt really hard for you. And who knows, maybe I was overstepping in that moment, but I just felt that pull. And she's like, yeah, I just, I feel like he, he has such big feelings and they take up so much space. I said, what would be the worst thing that would happen if anyone else was inconvenienced and you just let him have the emotion? And the idea being, and her face was just like, huh. And we had a much deeper, longer conversation. And again, probably more therapeutic than she was interested in at the soccer game. But the notion of how often are we just trying to appease everybody else's story? We don't want to inconvenience anyone else, which is rooted to when we were kids and not wanting to be an inconvenience to the people around us. The other two things that we're going to think about is that there isn't a right way to feel and that there isn't a timeline through which we should be fine. So I've had this come up even with some of my clients of, well, gosh, I feel like my kid is just like constantly sad or upset about this thing. You know, they had, it's been a week. Why are they still upset? Like this, they should be fine by now. This isn't that big of a deal. Or for ourselves, I've had these micro interactions with Everly where on the outside, anybody else would see it and go, 
yeah, I probably would have done the same thing. Or like, yeah, maybe you seemed a little bit emotional in that moment. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. It will take me four or five days to let go of the driving thought in my head that literally hits me like this all day long that I'm a terrible mom because maybe I handled one situation the way that I didn't want to. I won't sleep. I will ruminate on it. I will have dreams that I am screwing her up in some way because I have such a pervasive idea that this is how I was supposed to be. And when I can't, I'm in that sort of vigilant panic state. So really recognizing that when we're having these feelings, they're there. And so what we can do is to learn from them, to be curious about them, but we can't move our kids or ourselves through them any faster. So I'm curious, as I said, some of these things and just starting to think about maybe some of the rules or expectations you have of yourself. I'd love it if everyone could just put in the chat one thing they're going to let go of. What's one thought that you're going to give yourself permission to let go of as you move forward? Yeah, Lindsay says that I'm not doing enough because the reality is you're never going to do enough if the metrics are coming through shame. It's a moving target. You're never going to feel like you've done enough. Other people's opinions, absolutely. I love that phrase. I don't know who said it, but this notion of what, what you think of me is none of my business. And the idea being if at the end of the day, I can go home and say, I'm trying to be the best version of myself I can be, that's really all that matters. Yeah, the idea that I have control. And to clarify, I have control over some things. And my right is to be able to take control of those and stop trying to control everything I can't. Yeah, you're going to let go of this idea. I've already screwed up horribly. And she's only 15 months, so there's no hope. I had that happen to me one night where I literally was up all night and was like, did I, did I screw her up? Because it was we were having bedtime problems. And I ended up yelling at her and was like, go to bed. I am not going to have another conversation with you until tomorrow morning. I'm done. Go to bed. And like, just felt like I was losing it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I screwed her up. She doesn't feel safe. What if she wakes up in the middle of the night and she has a terrible dream? What if she needs something? She's not going to feel like I'm there for her. The reality is she's fine. If we all think about this, none of us needed our parents or caregivers to be perfect. What we needed them to do is to come back and talk to us about the times they didn't get it right and that we didn't get it right with grace, humility, and resilience. Come back to that idea. We didn't, we don't ever need someone to be perfect. What we need is accountability and open communication. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about as we start to do this, one of the things that we need to do is to start to attune to our body. So rebuilding our connection. As you start to begin this work, you're going to recognize, gosh, I've turned off all lines of communication to my emotional and my physical self. So how do we start to do that work? Well, the first thing that you have to do is to figure out how you're avoiding your body. So again, shutting down cues, not taking time to eat, not listening to yourself when you have to go to the bathroom. Also thinking about the ways that we are stunting our emotional processing or experience. So whether that is using substances, TV, social media, you're avoiding plans with other people, you're whatever you're doing, but you're shutting down so that you aren't thinking about all of those things. And so starting to get a feel for how am I avoiding? What are the barriers? So I can begin to lift some of those. Now, as you do that, tuning back into your body, into your emotions, it kind of feels like a beach ball that's been stuffed beneath the surface and you're just waiting for it to explode up and hit you in the face. So that can be really overwhelming. So in conjunction with starting to name and work through some of the avoidance sides, we need to also learn how we're going to tolerate our distress in those moments that we're starting to do this because it's going to be painful. You're going to be turning and facing things that you have spent probably decades trying to ignore. So I'm going to give you four ways that you can do that to start to practice every day what that looks like to build some capacity for distress tolerance. And then over time, how to use these skills to mitigate some of that distress moving forward. So I'm going to ask you at the end to just put you in but one, two, three, or four, you can write what it is, but I'm going to have you all pick one that you're going to start to do in the next few weeks, just to put it into practice and see. And then we're going to make our transition. We're going to talk about our kids now and really thinking about what this looks like to shift into and talk about now, how do we help our children in this same process? And like many of you said, in tandem with doing this work that we're already doing for ourselves. So the first part is to start to do what's called a daily practice. Now, daily practices could be anything that you do every day, but the idea is that you have sort of an intention behind it that's about anchoring or releasing. So again, a daily practice is about anchoring or releasing. 
If it's a daily practice of meditation, it's going to be around anchoring your thoughts, sort of coming into that present moment. For me, I like to do meditation is not my jam in the same way. So instead, what I really think about is a values focus. So kind of mining through what's the value that I want to anchor on and what does that look like to embody that value and how I show up in this moment. On the flip side, if we're talking about releasing, it's recognizing what can we do to release some of the things that we're carrying with us every day. So if anyone's ever had that to-do list and you're like, okay, I keep getting here, but there's like the same five things that I have to recopy over every single day to my next day's to-do list. What if we just stop doing that? What if we stopped making our list so long or we stopped carrying so many things with us to bed and setting ourselves up the next day to have that plus everything else that comes in? So the idea, and oftentimes I think about this as happening in the evening, although for some people it definitely works better in the morning, is to do a brain dump. So just sitting down and writing down anything that they're holding on to. I feel like I'm a terrible mom. I feel like I didn't handle that interaction well. I'm feeling X, Y, Z, whatever that is, just dumping all of those thoughts down because part of what we need to do is to get them out of our head. Our shame has power in here. It doesn't have as much power on the paper. So just being able to say, I'm going to put those here. And you know what? I'm pretty consistent. I'm going to tell myself those same things tomorrow. So I'm going to just start to practice being able to let these go tonight. And I'm going to trust they're going to come back tomorrow. Still going to feel like I'm a crappy parent. Still going to feel like I'm not getting it right. That seems to be my norm right now because I'm not yet able to give myself enough grace to say, I am doing the best that I can. I'm learning. Maybe I didn't handle everything perfect. That doesn't mean I'm a bad parent. The second thing that we can do is to focus on sort of our preparing for or just sort of cultivating more resilience. So the idea is to start to think about where we are creating double suffering. So double suffering is the idea that we get worked up or anxious about things that could happen. So we're spending all our time worried about it, anxious about it, planning for it. If it happens, we're still going to be stressed and anxious and overwhelmed, and it doesn't do anything to make it better. So I think about sort of the shift of instead of saying, okay, the next time that Everly has a tantrum, this is exactly what I'm going to say, and this is how I'm going to do it, and this is who I'm going to be. Instead, I just really focus on when Everly has a tantrum, what do I want to remind myself? Because I'm not going to get it right. I'm not going to be able to pull out my checklist and say, okay, did I say this? Okay, and say it. Okay, what about this? I do this and then say it. And it's not one of those, well, if they do this, then say this. Like that's not how human interactions go. So instead of trying to prepare myself to make sure it either doesn't happen or I'm perfect in it, I say, okay, how do I start to figure out what I'm going to do when something happens by way of saying, who do I want to be, not what am I going to do? The third thing that we can do sort of again in sort of this distress tolerance piece is to stop making everything with our kids about us. So really just like realizing most things that kids do are not a result of whether or not you handled something perfect. It's because kids are supposed to do those things. Every kid lies. Every kid has a tantrum. Every kid is going to blow you off and not listen to you at some point in public. Every kid is going to say something mean to you at some point. That is their job. That is how they are trying things on. So if we instead stop thinking about it as something that we failed, we have to fix, they're hurting us in some way, shape, or form, just being like, gosh, how cool is it that my kid is doing exactly what they're supposed to do? How great. I mean, it doesn't feel great. I get it. But if we could say that, what if we stopped taking it so personal? The instant that we can do that, so when your kid does something, again, the lying piece has been a big one for me. So when Everly does try out a lie, I now can be like, how cool is this? She, she's growing. Instead of going, she's lying, and I go back to my inner child self where I feel triggered, and it's all about me and how she's hurting me, and she's supposed to somehow know and correct this. Therefore, I need to fix it so she doesn't do this again. And so really starting to separate that out and not making their journey sort of enmeshed with mine. And then the final space is to, or the final step is to really think about how do you make space for you to process? So we started talking about this in general, but this idea of most of us are not taking enough time. I think about this a lot. My husband and I, he's a very silent processor. So often when something happens with Everly in the moment, I'm the one that speaks up and says something. And what I've thought about is that there are times where I think I feel such an urgency in the moment to fix something, to do something. And I will respond faster and faster the more elevated I am. And that's when I shift from responding to reacting, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this notion of what would it look like if when I'm feeling triggered, what if my goal is just to learn what triggered feels like? 
And then my immediate is I go take two minutes alone in the bathroom, or I'm going to just say, Hey, I need a second. I'm going to go. And even like what I'm doing now is I'm going to grab one of the stuffed animals from the feelings corner. And I'm just going to hold that for a minute and take some deep breaths. Cause I notice I'm feeling really charged. What would that look like? Not because we need them to then react a certain way, but because in that moment, by doing that, I'm validating that I am having a feeling that I have a right to feel and to move through before I put the role back on and figure out how to handle it for them. Okay, we're going to go into now what we're going to do for our kids. How do we extend this into things with our kids? We have about 25 minutes left. I'm going to keep rolling because we have some good copy to go through. If you need a break or space, go take that for a second. If you have questions, go ahead and dump them into the chat as we're talking. And then if I'm missing anything as it comes through, Maddie will come off mute and let me know. Otherwise, you can kind of just do a bump and remind me that it's there. With our kids, what I really want to say again is you can't master everything with you and then take on things with your kids. You also can't do everything to make your kids feel great and then deal with your stuff. We're doing both at the same time, which means that this is messy. And again, to set the stage, your job is not to figure out how to do this perfectly. Your job is to figure out how to show up and do it with a little bit more grace. Because when we can be compassionate and graceful with ourselves and our kids, it makes the accountability piece a lot easier. So starting to think about in general, one of the things that we didn't have done for us that we can start to work on with our kids is building their baseline, what we say EQ, which is emotional intelligence, and BQ, which is body intelligence. So starting to help them just draw connections to these two parts of themselves, instead of just being up here in their head, but really thinking about, gosh, what was your body telling you right there? Or, hey, let's check in with, you know, one thing I do, I was an eating disorder therapist for many years. So when we're at the table, my whole thing with my daughter is, what's your belly telling you? How's your belly and your body feel right now? Does it need any more bites? Is it feeling full? What's happening here? I'm never going to ask her to take another bite. I'm never going to force her to do more food. I'm really trying to empower her to recognize when is your body full? When is your body hungry? Now, if I can tell she's simply distracted or she's blowing off eating something because she's waiting for her next snack or something, then on the back end, instead of trying to force it in that moment, I just say, okay, it sounds like your body's really full right now. When you're hungry, I'll have this out and ready for you so that we can work on some snack or like use this for our snack later on. So just starting to think about subtle ways that we can do that. The emotional intelligence piece is really this notion of how do we start to introduce the idea that emotions happen? And one of the best ways that we can do it is through stories using the idea of other characters and stories that they can relate to. So with little, little kids, there's a ton of emotion-centered books. I love the little spot books. I'll just write that in the chat. But the little spot books are fantastic. I even, some of my clients, adult clients, I've read the books to them because it teaches all about a little spot of anger, a little spot of boredom, a little spot of rejection, and they're beautiful. There's also tons of other stories that you can get. As kids get older, there's different stories that they can lean into. You can use shows, you can use pictures, whatever it is. The art of storytelling and sort of playing into sort of the fantasy aspect is a great way and a safe space for kids to move through their emotions because we know that experience. We've done that with a show or for me, it was Harry Potter. I could move through and feel all of my feelings through this area and it felt safe because I was feeling them through these characters because remember my reality, it wasn't safe to feel the feelings here. As you're doing that, you can do something called creating a feelings corner. Again, this looks different depending on how old your kids are, but this notion of how do I create a supportive environment where emotions are allowed to exist? We're going to talk about behaviors in a little bit, but where emotions are allowed to exist. I would highly encourage you that this is not their bedroom. We want their bedroom to be a place that they can go to, that they can feel all of their feelings and they can self-select to go there. But if we start to make their bedroom the place that they go to every time they're having a big feeling, instead of the places that they also can go to feel calm, to feel centered, to relax, it starts to build this emotional intensity in their room. So ideally, it's a spot outside of it. It could just be a chair, a specific chair in your house or a little area where you've got all of these things available and ready for them. But just noticing that there's this idea of, hey, when we're feeling this, here's a safe place. For us, we have all sorts of stress toys and things that we can use. I go to it when I'm feeling overwhelmed. She goes to it. And then we just focus on, hey, gosh, this is a big feeling. Let's go hang out over here until we feel ready. It's never a place that we use to banish or to punish. Because again, that's not the goal. Their brain cannot separate that. 
We can talk about and really encourage behavior, but when you send them away, they hear that as I'm being sent away, not my behavior is being punished. We can use the power of modeling then. So this, I think, again, kind of relates back to some of the stories people have shared, but this notion of how do we talk to our kids about our own experiences? How do we talk about our own emotions? So I had this happen with me where actually I said something that I can't believe I said it to my kid. There was a problem with the question I'm just going to answer really quick, Renee, what age to start using a feelings corner? We started ours before Everly was a year old. I just had a basket and I have her now like one of her favorite dragons in there. And I actually, you're going to get a link to a playlist of videos that I've made all on parenting stuff on my YouTube. And I made an entire video on how to build a feelings corner with links to everything that we put in our feelings corner in the show notes. So you'll get that in the follow-up email. So for all of you that are like, wait a minute, I want to do this. So what do I put in it? Where do I go? It will be in my playlist. So you'll be able to access it. And if you can't find it, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure that I get you all that information. In the modeling piece, when I said this thing to her and I basically was like, oh my goodness, I, I, what I ultimately said, see, my shame doesn't want me to tell you, but we were having this interaction. Something was not, I don't even remember what it was, but in my head, this shouldn't be so hard. And I basically said to her, I, I need you to be a little bit more adult right now. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I was told every moment I was a kid. I needed to grow up. I needed to be more of an adult. I needed to learn how to take care of myself. My mom wasn't around. I was constantly going to have to figure I was alone. And I heard it come out. And I, I mean, I can feel it now. Like I'm smiling out of the awkwardness. But I immediately was like, I just traumatized my kid. She's not going to be a kid anymore. She's not going to know how to have these feelings. And I just, she looked at me and she started laughing. Like what a resilient response. Like, like, wait, I'm recognizing this isn't okay. And I immediately was just like, I'm so sorry. I, that was not an appropriate thing to do. But there was still this reality of what she was doing wasn't okay. I came back later at a different time and said to her, I was feeling really triggered in that moment because I think I was feeling unheard. And I was feeling like you weren't listening to me. And I spent a lot of time feeling like I wasn't listened to as a kid and then just being told that I should just kind of move on and get over it. And I think that part of my brain came out at you. And that was so, so, so not fair. And I am incredibly sorry. And I don't ever want you to feel like you need to be anything other than a kid right now. And I'm going to work really hard to make sure that I don't say that again. And just being able to say that and name it out loud, the fact that I'm telling you guys this story right now, I didn't want to tell you. I had no intention of saying that today. But the fact that I'm saying it, I'm taking the shame out of it. Being like, okay, so that probably wasn't great. And to me, it feels like the worst thing in the world. But in reality, it wasn't that bad. It's okay. She's fine. She still feels safe. She still feels seen. In all of this, what we do is we start to try to use our modeling as a way to empower them, not control them. So when we share on those equal platforms, what we're ultimately doing is we're talking with them, not at them. And one of the things that I think is key is we were mostly brought up with what's called conditional love. So the idea that we were, we owed our elders respect, even the notion of, I don't know if anyone else can relate to this, but growing up the number of times that I was told to hug somebody, tell them I love you or to do something that I didn't want to do as a kid is astronomical. And so this notion of you owe them that, that's your elder. If they want to come give you a hug, you give them a hug. If they want to talk to you, if they want you to do something, you listen because that's what you do. But instead, what we need to think about is human to human, we are not owed respect. We are not owed those things. There is still a consequence. We are still the parents. We still have the right to set boundaries. And they get to choose how they show up in that. Our job then is to develop consequences that match that behavior because we're empowering them to make decisions that align with their values, not because they feel like they have to listen to us to be loved and approved of by us. Now, that is tricky. Some people hate when I make that statement because they believe, well, our kids owe us respect. I 100% get that. And that's what you were taught. And what would it have been like if you felt like you could give that freely, not because you were supposed to? So one of the things that I think about and one of the things I do with Everly is she is always allowed to ask me why. If I have a rule, if I have a boundary, if there's something I tell her she can do, she can't do, she gets to ask me why on anything. There's a clear delineation. She is owed an explanation it is not fair to say to somebody, do it because I told you so. We all experience that in our daily lives now with your boss, with somebody else around you where they're just telling you to do something and the expectation is you're going to do it. You have every right to understand why a request is being made. So do our kids. So helping them, instead of seeing a why as a challenge to you, seeing why as an invitation for you to come back and be able to go, hey, so why am I saying this? 
And if I feel really solid and good in it, and this happens to me all the time, there's times where I actually tell her she can or can't do something. And then she'll say, well, why not? And then I go to explain it. And I'm like, you know, I actually don't have a really good reason why you can't do this right now. I'm, I'm going to change what I said. And it's allowing me to practice humility. Because sometimes I just say it because I'm annoyed and I don't want to give her another thing. That's not a totally fair reason. Sometimes I still stick with it and I am just annoyed and I don't want to do it. And just being honest of I'm done. I'm mentally done and I don't have the capacity to go out and ride bikes again with you right now, whatever that is. But really separating that hearing you and following what we're asking them to do can still happen while they are learning and understanding why we are asking them to do things. Now, as you do all of this, this one's going to be a little bit tricky for many of us as we are learning. But I think what's incredibly important is to remember that they don't know what these experiences are. They don't know what emotions are. There's a time I remember, gosh, I must have been just over three, and she was feeling this big feeling. And I was like, what's going on? What's happening? She was kind of yelling, screaming. It was like borderline full-blown tantrum. And she's like, I don't know. And I'm like, that's probably the most honest statement that we could make. Most of our kids, most of us don't necessarily know what we're feeling. We just know our reaction to what we're feeling. So how do we help name their emotions and how do we use modeling to name ours when we're having any sort of feeling that we're having? Can we name that? So Everly, my husband and I try to do this at least once a day when we're all around, but sometimes more if we can, or we'll just do a pause and we'll say, how are we all feeling right now? And we just do one word check-ins, just one word to describe how we're feeling. And sometimes she says the same thing over and over again. She's four. She doesn't fully understand them all, but she gets a chance to see that in a given day, we all feel different emotions. There's a spectrum to those things. So as you go through this, I already mentioned this, but I just want to really hit on the idea of how do we not make whatever they're feeling about us? So really realizing that their job is to do some of these hard things. They didn't wake up in the morning and go, how can I make my parents day the hardest day possible? They are waking up in the morning trying to make sense of and move through something that's really difficult. The other thing that I think we do is sometimes we dismiss the intensity of their feelings based on our scaling of that experience. So I used to work for a volleyball coaching organization, a club volleyball team, and the girls that I coached were all 12 and 13. So they would be talking about things like breakups or a fight with a friend. And I could hear this. And I know at 36, or I think at the time, maybe I was 26 or 27, that they're going to have more friends, more partners, more whatever it is. Things won't, it's not the end of the world. But me at that age doesn't relate to them at that age. And so really recognizing that there's this thing called the power of relative relatability so when somebody says, gosh, I had a bad breakup or I didn't get the grade I wanted on a test or I'm feeling really sad about this or I had a fight with my parent, whatever that looks like, how do I connect that to something that I'm experiencing now to help them recognize, oh, I get it on this level. How can I connect with this? So when I think about, you know, when my daughter got really upset about something that she was doing, she was trying to do pass the swim test. She didn't pass it. She got upset. She threw her goggles. She said she was never going to swim again. How do we instead say, gosh, that's a super big feeling. And instead of being like, you'll get this, you'll be fine. Look at how much you've done. And just kind of minimizing the feeling going, I would feel really disappointed too. That happened to me the other day when I was doing X at work. And I remember feeling that feeling. What can I do for you in that moment? Or like, how can I be here for you right now? What do you need? And just starting to empower them to think about that instead of saying, you'll get over it. Things will be fine or expecting that those things will be the case. One of the phrases that I use, I'll actually copy it because I jotted it down. Oh, I don't know if it's going to let me copy it out of the chat, but I'll see if I can. But one of the things that I like to use is basically this messaging. So something like this, that's a big feeling. It sounds like you're feeling blank because you're upset. It's time to get out of the pool, leave the park, whatever it is. That makes sense. I would feel the same way too if I wanted something that I couldn't do. And so again, this idea of relating to, it's not the actual thing they're upset about, it's the feeling that we're having. So don't get fixated on the what, focus on the feeling. And remember as you're doing that, that their emotions, most emotions actually need a maximum of 90 seconds to be moved through. If we can give them space, most emotions completely come down after 90 seconds. Some don't, we can't use that as a rule, but oftentimes, even thinking about our little, little kids, when they're crying, they're upset, that like quick rush of stop, stop crying, don't be upset. We're rushing them through it. And when they can't complete it, it just gets stuffed. And then the next time they feel one, now they're feeling this one and this one at the same time. And then they don't finish it completely. So it gets stuffed. And the next time they have another emotion, now they're feeling these ones and this, and there's all these incomplete cycles they're trying to finish. 
So if we can learn how to give them that space to have their 90 seconds, what would that look like? How might they be able to shift some of their perspective? So as we're going through this, we talked a lot now about how do you recognize your shame? How do you recognize some of your own inner child pain? How do you make some of those shifts for yourself? And then how do you start to talk about emotions with your kids? One of the things that I think is super important is to start to recognize, again, that you're doing this with them. Your job is not to be perfect at it. And so I have a lot of these conversations appropriately with my kids. She doesn't need to know my trauma to understand that I have a hard time with a certain feeling. So how do I share that with her appropriately and then hold myself accountable when maybe the way that I react is out of that place of reaction or trigger? Now, one of the things that I think is really helpful as we start to do this, we talked about radical acceptance. Now I want you to think about this in the context of raising emotionally resilient kids and how they show up outside of the home. So for many of us, we need to teach our kids what's ours, what's not, what's theirs, what's not. And so starting to practice the art of radical acceptance for themselves as well. So again, I think about this friend of hers at school who just has diff a different reaction in the morning. They are like, by all intents and purposes, best friends, as best friends as you can be at four years old, but they're always playing together. They are, we have play dates all the time. They are constantly wanting to connect with each other. Mornings are difficult. And this girl just needs more space in the morning. And so when we think about every morning when Everly would get to school, she's like ready and she's excited and she would call for her friend and she would just want to play with her. And sometimes her friend just needed space. She was not yet ready for the day to be started. She was missing her parents. She didn't want to be where she was. Give her 30 minutes, things would be fine. Everly would come home and tell me that she felt like Maddie didn't want to be her friend anymore. Maddie didn't like her. Maddie didn't want to be around her anymore. And so we had to have a big conversation of, gosh, I think Maddie's feeling isn't about you. I don't think this has anything to do with you. I think it's affecting you and your emotions are valid. Let's talk about that. And we can let her know and maybe come up with a different plan, but that's not yours. That doesn't mean it's that you did something wrong or that it's yours to fix. Or in some instances, when someone acts a certain way towards us, that that means that we are deserving of that because they treat us a certain way. So for her, a lot of the conversation was basically saying, that feels like maybe our job is to not make that ours and to say, gosh, your friend just needs a little more time in the morning. Maybe she's not communicating it in the way that you would like her to. She'll work on that. She'll get to that on her own. But how about in the mornings you go play and you let her come to you? You don't take that on to set yourself up in that same place over and over again, because how she's feeling, that's not your ball. That's not yours to pick up and to take on. One of the things we can do with that then is to help them see beyond the moment. So the idea that this won't be there forever. So again, validate that they feel it now, but also help them recognize, and this will not be the way that you or them or the people around you always feel. Now, the last couple of things that I want to say, and then we'll probably have about two or three minutes for questions. So if you already have questions, put them in the chat so I know and can anticipate them. Otherwise, you're going to get a follow-up email with tons of information from me. So hopefully that will kind of answer a lot of questions and give you some resources. And then you can also ask me your questions directly there as well. But the last kind of key things that I really want to hit on is one, we've been talking a lot about emotions. Many of us confuse behaviors with emotions. So it's incredibly important that as we're moving through this, you can have an expectation or an idea or a goal for how you want to behave and how you want your kids to behave in a given moment. That is the part that we can work on molding. The emotions are separate. Emotions are not controllable. We don't choose the emotion that we feel in a moment. So we need to practice the art of validating an emotion while also correcting a behavior or helping shift and guide behaviors. So one of the things that I do is, for example, and I'll kind of paste this because I've written some of these down. So let me figure out if I can get it pasted again. But I'll often say things like this. And it's going to feel in the beginning like you're reading from a script, but the more easily that you're able to kind of put this stuff into practice, the easier it is to say it. So kind of this condensed version of this is, you know, you get to feel sad. Or even now, as I've done this with Everly long enough, I'm saying, do you get to feel sad? Are you totally allowed to feel however you're feeling right now? Yeah, absolutely. And you screaming at me is not an okay way to react to that feeling. So we need to come up with a different solution in this moment right now, because this is not okay. Now, sometimes in the moment when your kid is already at a 10, they're not going to hear you. So it might be just kind of helping them move through the behavior and then using this phrasing at the end. Gosh, it seemed like you felt really, really angry right there when I told you it was time to leave the park. And your body and your brain decided that kicking me or hitting me was an okay way to communicate. 
That is not a way that we're going to communicate with each other. It is not okay for you to make me feel unsafe in my body. And so when we are feeling those things, we need to come up with a different way. You can also share what you do, how you move through your feelings. You can give them some options. We can also then pull back in that power of storytelling. So maybe that's where you get some books on what it looks like to talk about frustration. And then in the moment when that keeps happening the next time and they go to hit or they go to scream, then you start to say those things. You get to feel angry. You do not get to hit my body. Or you get to feel sad. You do not get to scream at me right now. So whatever that looks like, and then coming back later and starting to validate that, that they felt those things, and here's the change. The thing I think is super important with this is oftentimes then we just want them to never do it again. Remember, that's not how humans work. They will still have times they do those things. So what you notice, even for subtle things, is did they pause? Did they stop sooner? Did they hear you? Were they able to recognize that it wasn't okay later on? Again, instead of looking for perfection, how can we really process with them what it's like to develop healthy and adaptive pathways to move through their emotions? And the last thing that I just want to say is that for many of us, we get lost in this idea of for ourselves. If I were to ask you right now to tell me everything you say to yourself in a day, the majority of it, majority of it is going to be negative. Now we have to be super mindful about that. So when we think about how we talk to ourselves and how we talk to our kids, we need to use what's called the three to one rule. So it's ideally a minimum of three positive compliment or positive statements for every one negative. So if you think about this, you've definitely gotten stuck in a rut. I have as a parent for sure, where I feel like everything I'm saying is negative. I'm constantly correcting her behavior or telling her what she shouldn't be doing or what I don't like. And then I'm in my head constantly telling myself everything I'm not doing right and all the ways that I am failing. And so really starting to adapt this idea of how do I bring the three to one into the space? How do I really start to help them understand ways that they can move forward and how she can see, gosh, you are an amazing human and you are learning and you are growing. And here's some things we're not going to do, or here are some things that we need to continue to talk about, whatever that might look like. And in all of this, just kind of reminding ourselves that in any given moment, we are all literally doing the best we can. You might feel like you wish you could do something different. Hindsight is a great way to create judgment. Instead, can we say in that moment, my body was doing the best it could to try to move through something. And maybe my body jumped back to when I was six and I don't like that. I have some insight now that I can work on it. But in that moment, how do I give myself grace that I did the best I could? and that my kid did the best that they could. And again, reminding ourselves that our kids aren't asking for perfection. Our kids are asking us to show up and hold ourselves and them accountable and to continually reinforce that their worth and value, the same as our worth and value, is not eroded because we didn't get it right. Okay, we are right at the end. We have some time for Q&A. I saw one question come in. As questions are coming in through the chat, I want you to take a moment and you can write it down in the chat if you want to or write it on your own sheet of paper. But I want you to just ask yourself, okay, this was a ton of information. I know I have the recording. I know I have the slides. I know I'm getting a ton of resources. I don't need to do it all right now. I know my brain wants me to and it wants me to get it perfect. But what's one thing that I could do? Again, coming back to your intention and the goal of raising emotionally resilient humans and helping ourselves become more emotionally resilient as well, what's one thing that you're gonna take on as you move forward? Again, I'd love to see it in the chat, but if you wanna just write it on your sheet of paper and keep it for yourself, that's totally okay too. Now, a question that came in, Angela says, what are examples of things to recommend a toddler to do when they're mad, sad, or frustrated? So I think a lot of this has to do with, kind of, each of those is a slightly different feeling to me, and it depends on your feelings around them using their body. So some people, when someone's mad or frustrated, what we know is that small humans, so toddlers specifically, feel things very physical. It's why sometimes you'll experience that they are hitting things, they are moving more intensely. So a lot of the times I will recommend using something that they can use their hands or their body to move through. So stress balls, glitter flip things that you can get, you can make them with an old soda bottle, if you have, we get these like stretchy bands. A lot of these links to things that I have used are in my feelings corner sheet as well, because this is all stuff that's in the feelings corner. I often, I mean, some people will use the, you can punch a pillow. Some people are against that because they don't like the idea of, of asking someone to punch something. But again, the idea of punching a pillow doesn't mean they're gonna punch a human. It's recognizing that you have this big feeling in your body that's trying to get out right now and you don't know how to get it out. 
So my daughter tends to really like like this, the pulling things, or we have like a soft area. So anything that she wants in that area, if she's feeling upset and she wants to throw it, if she wants to squeeze it really tight, she can, and it's a safe space and place that she can use it. And then the goal is again, that she's then taking herself into a safe zone and space where she can feel those things. Yeah. And Amanda, you're saying about somebody talking back. And I think that that's like a really triggering thing for many of us is when they're not showing you respect and you feel like they shouldn't do that. I think one of the things that I would recommend because at seven, he can start to hear this is what does it feel like for you when he says that? And so saying, when you talk to me that way, it makes me feel this way. Can you help me understand why you're challenging everything? Or I'm having a hard time understanding why everything I am saying is always being challenged. Some way just kind of putting that back. He's not going to say something right away, but just starting to help him understand that. And maybe being able to even suggest the idea of when that happens, like when I say something, I need us to stop feeling like everything is a battle. So you have a right to ask me questions, but pushing back on everything that I'm saying is only making me want to have more of a consequence or kind of pull away more. It's not getting yours or my needs met in the moment. So just starting to help him understand the impact on you and how it's not actually working for him as well. All right. We are right at time. And Kara, I just want to thank you for coming and giving us a whole bunch of things to think about. I know I am still processing and I have a notebook <laughs> full. Uh, so I want to thank everyone too for uh, watching. I also am putting our website in the link. So if you want to sign up for future events, we would love to have you all back. I will be sending a follow-up um, with the Zoom link as well and all the other resources. Um, but thank you everyone. And I will make sure we end this right on time. And so until next time. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you so much.